Hello, welcome back. In the first video, we have looked at uh, the three components already, three kind of devices. One is input, an output, and the storage devices of a computer system. And today, as promised, we'll look at the CPU, how it works. Okay, this is a similar to the one you have seen, but with a little bit detail, which shows the memory, the RAM and the CPU, the processor, separately. Okay, so you can see the input store, uh, device send data into the memory and the storage will take data from the, mem the RAM, the memory, and also feed it with data as well. The output, you can see the arrow is pointing outwards from the memory, so the data is coming out of the memory into the output device. The CPU, the processor, is taking data from the memory and also putting back as well. So now we look at this, these two boxes together. The bottom one is the processor. That's the one when you say you have i3, i5, i7 processor. The top one is the memory, it's RAM, the memory. Okay, these two work together. The processor has got very little memory. It can't remember things. Just work on it and put it away. Uh, it has a few small registers temporarily keeping data for it to use. In the processor, you have uh, two other units. One is control unit, and one is ALU, arithmetic and logic unit. Okay. The rest are the registers. And uh, you could have an in processor cache, so it's more memory. The control unit decides what to get from the memory, where to get it from. And then the control unit, control unit will look at the, the data retrieved from the memory and see whether it's what command, what operation needs to be done and tell the ALU. ALU will do the operations like adding, subtracting, like comparing whether A is equal to B and so on. And the result of the ALU is stored in the register if it's not put back to the memory straight away, okay? Because once this one says, all right, you've done one, do the next one, the whole thing, most of it, will be reset. So there's not much memory here. Everything goes back to the main memory. In the main memory, you can imagine, you, all, you will always need to have the operating system to work there. So the, the programs are all in the memory. And then you always have to have something useful for you, like a Word, like Excel, like PowerPoint. That's called application programs. Application programs one and two. I've just got two examples there. Each one, each of them would have a program area with all the instructions, how to do things, and the data, like a files. Each one will have that. All of these are stored in there in the digital format. Okay, zeros or one and ones. Here I've drawn this cache. Cache is used because the processor is much, much faster than the RAM. Therefore, uh, people design a cache to speed up. Okay, that's not the main point we're talking about here, okay? So we've learned about the three units inside the processor. Control unit, ALU, and registers. And inside the memory, we know it has, it has programs and data. All of this are digital uh, data in terms of ones and zeros. And when they are transmitting data, actually you see these electron, electronic pulses. Okay, zeros and ones, zeros and ones, okay? That's data transmission between different parts. Let's look at this one. A few terms uh, you should uh, be familiar with, okay? One is clock speed. When you talk about the processor, it's clock speed. 1.4 gigahertz, 2.3 gigahertz, and so on. And you can compare. Obviously, the faster, the higher the clock speed, the faster it works, and the more powerful it becomes. Then is multiple processing cores how many processes you can have in that little chip, okay? You can have dual core, you can have quad core, you can have more, depending on how many cores you can pack in there, and they have to all work together. Cache memory we mentioned, okay? Cache memory is, to, is used between different components to speed up the transfer, okay? because their speed difference is so much, therefore you use a cache to store something temporarily, just in case it's needed. If it's not needed, uh, it doesn't waste much. Data bus. Data bus is the highway inside the processor uh, for transmitting data or between components as well. It's a system bus. Obviously, the wider the bus, the more wire you 
more wires you have, the better, because you can transmit data, uh, more data in one go. That's related to the word length. Word length is the register size. When people say, are you using 32 bits processor or 64 bits processor, which is a word length. 32 bits means you will use four bytes for one word. That means the registers are all four bytes uh, in size. Or if you use 64, that means you use 8 bytes. Then, obviously, the 64 bits can handle more information in any one go than the 32 bits. That's why it's better. These are basic terms. Then you should be able to compare them. If I give you two computers, you see which one is better or might be better. In this video, we have to cover something here. It's analog and digital data conversion because this is part of learning aim B. Learning aim B is how data is transmitted or communicated. Now, the data is always, always digital data in the computer. But in real life, there are so many different kind of data. Analog is one of them. So you have to convert analog into a digital data. How do you do that? Say, for example, sound waves. How do you represent sound waves in digital data? The basic principle is this. You give a continuous wave, an analog wave, you measure them at regular intervals. Those measurements, those data figure you've collected, and convert those numbers into binary data, into digital data. And therefore, you would have groups of binary data to represent your analog data. That's the principle. How do you convert them? That's the next topic. It's converting dinary to binary. Dinary is, dinary is the base 10 numbers, the ones we use every day. Binary is the base 2 system, where you only have 1 or 0. When you have reached 2, you carry on to the next uh, digit. Okay, there's no 2, only 0 or 1. Very briefly, okay, let's look at this number. 1,234. We all know that. That's easy. And um, we also know that for each place, there is a value. This place is unit. So 4 means 4 units. This place, i got 3. It's not 3 units. It's 3 tens. So that one is 10. The place value is 10. 10. So 3 times 10, that's the value of this place. Okay. Now this one is 2, but it's 200. Therefore, the value, place value is two, is 100, okay, 1,000, and so on, so on, okay. So the, this one is 1,000 plus 200 plus 330 plus 4, that's therefore is 1,234. In binary system, it's very much the same. Each place has a value, place value. If I write three, four numbers here, 1, 1, 0, 1, you can't see anything else, only 1s or zeros. you can't have 2, okay, because it's binary. Anything's 2, you carry over to the next digit. Okay. Now, so you got four digits, they are next to each other. The one, the most significant one on the far left, that has the highest value, its value is 8. If I have 1 here, that means I've got 8 already, already there, okay. This one, the place value is 4, therefore if I have 1, that means 4. This place value is 2, I've got no, nothing there, 0, that means no, no 2. The place value is 1, I've got 1. So you can imagine the number of, the value of this one, if you work it out in, in the 10 base, base 10 number, will be 8 plus 4 plus 1, which is 13. So that's binary number, it's not that hard. Okay, how to convert a binary number into binary number? This section gives you the clear instructions. Imagine if I want to transfer, uh, convert 7 into a binary number, then I'll find out 7. Can I fit 8 into 7? No, I cannot. Therefore, 0. Then can I fit 4 into 7? Yes. So I fit 4 and there are 3 left. So for that 3, can I fit 2 into 3? Yes, go 1. Once you fit 2 into 3, then you go 1 left, there are 1 fit into 1. So that's one manual method. Uh, later on, if you're interested, I'll show you how to calculate so that you can use computers to convert them automatically. Okay?